Hi, I'm Thomas Bowles, Prince William County Agricultural Extension Agent. Welcome to our video. All right, good morning, everyone. Uh, today, our class is on septic systems. We have with us a uh, guest speaker, Dr. Philip Brown, who is the um, septic specialist in extension. Um, he's with the School of Plant and Environmental Sciences at Virginia Tech, and he is going to explain everything we'd ever want to know about septic systems. And then we'll have time for questions at the end. So with that, Dr. Brown, whenever you're ready. Thank you. Thanks, Thomas. Yeah, everything you ever wanted to know and more, maybe. <laughs> yeah. um, it's, it, this is going to be kind of an overall introduction to septic systems. And uh, as Thomas says, I'm over at Virginia Tech. I'm the extension specialist in soil science and septic systems. Um, so here's an introduction to the introduction. Um, so this is kind of my chance to kind of sell septic systems to people. Septic systems, um, they are uh, the combined soil science, which is uh, kind of what I do, and engineering. So they're a really clever way of, of uh, kind of managing human waste. They're, they're um, a great thing, septic systems. Um, they are kind of easy and they are environmentally conscious so long as they are working <laughs> when they when they stop working they are definitely not as environmentally conscious um, so if they are mismanaged then they may fail and in that instance they are expensive to repair and they can also be hazardous to both people and the environment so uh, throughout time man has always uh, been trying to get rid of human waste so if we look uh, kind of over in the top left corner that's a, a, a roman uh, toilet facility which is kind of a communal toilet facility and um, they're, they're all there and it's got um, kind of drainage ways to remove uh, human waste and so i mean all great civilizations had something along these lines um, so this was the Roman version. Uh, interesting fact about the Roman um, toilet facilities, they had a communal sponge to clean themselves with that was kind of dipped in vinegar between, <laughs> between each other, um, which sounds fairly disgusting, to be honest with you. <laughs> and then if we move to the right of that one, this is a, a castle. Um, so the castles had just basically had a hole in the wall, kind of a long drop that would drop down to the moat or whatever happened to be on the other side. Um, when I was younger, um, you may be surprised to learn I'm not from Virginia. I'm actually from England over in the UK. And we used to go see castles when we were kids because it was a lot of fun. And my dad would always make me and my brothers look down these holes and be like, oh, I've got to look down the hole. And then he'd reveal that that was where, that was where people... Um, got rid of their, their waste at that point, which was always quite amusing. And we fell for it many, many times. Um, so that's a, um, another way of getting rid of it. Um, the middle is a, a road called the Shambles in York. And you can imagine these houses are very close together and people would kind of throw the, the waste out of the window early in the morning, you know, get rid of everything. And it would just drop on the on the road and it would kind of move down the road. It would be washed away. Not definitely not a very hygienic way of doing things. Um, it's where the, the English term, the loo, going to the loo is going to the toilet because they would throw it out and they should so guard alert, which means watch out for water. And the English who can't pronounce French words very well ended up calling it guard loo. So the loo became the toilet, and that's kind of another way of disposing supposing human waste. Over on the right, we've got, I think that's Monticello, and it's one of the founding fathers' homes. That's a, an outhouse. There's another way, um, just a, a kind of a uh, somewhere off on the, in your land, and a big hole gets dug, and you get rid of the waste that way. Over on the far left, these are night men, and these were kind of Victorian people who would come around in the middle of the night and uh, dig up all of your waste from your outhouses or wherever you happen to be storing it and uh, take it off in a cart and dump it somewhere where it's no longer your problem 
So there's all these kind of different ways of getting rid of waste. However, in kind of the 1800s, they started coming up with this concept that is what we kind of developed into a septic tank. So the bottom left here is a fosse morass, which is uh, French for a, a morass tank, basically. And this has got all the kind of design things that we'd expect to see in a septic system. So we have a, a tank and we've got an inlet. So the waste goes into the tank and we've got an outlet. So the waste can leave the tank. And in this instance, um, it was for kind of big cities like Paris. So it would actually take the waste into the sewage, but you'd get a certain degree of treatment from the septic tank. And you've got a little kind of panel here which is um, a clean up so you can pull up to the surface and get rid of any waste that might be in there. And so this is kind of the precursor to uh, a septic system. Um, in the late uh, 1800s, we started to see septic systems in the US. Um, so this one on the top left is, is considered to be the first septic system um, in the US uh, from up in Boston, Massachusetts. And it's kind of got two chambers and we'll discuss kind of designs and why chambers are important, um, et cetera, in a minute. But the US um, is uh, it's a unique place for septic systems, or it's a great place for septic systems because um, Europe is, is very condensed, a lot of population, small area. The US is a, it's a massive place and part of the American dream is owning a bit of land and kind of building your own property on that land. So we have this, um, this great potential to have septic systems because uh, we, we can't always link into the sewage system, you, the municipal sewage system. So the US is kind of like the forefront of, of septic, septic work. And it kind of really took off in the US. Uh, before I go on any further, I do need to point out that it's not just human waste that goes into septic systems. It's kind of the, it's the comedy part of the septic system and it's kind of human waste going into them. But anything that goes down the drain will end up in your septic system if you have one. So if you use a washing machine, anything from that washing machine will end up in the septic system. Um, if you have a bath or a shower, both of those is going to the septic system. Garbage disposal unit, talk a little bit about about the garbage disposal units later on, but whatever is in there will end up in the septic system. Um, hand wash dishes, dishwasher, all of that water ends up in the, in the septic system. And if like this gentleman, you like to wash your bike in the bath, then that would also end up in the septic system, whatever comes off there. So let's have a, a review of a, a conventional gravity flow septic system. This is the most standard septic system. Um, <clears throat> so the most typical components is we have our house and we have our septic tank. So the wastewater from the house goes to the septic tank. From the septic tank, it then goes to a distribution box and it is then taken into the drain field and deposited through the drain lines and the gravel trenches. Um, so this is the most basic version. Um, this is all done through gravity. There's no um, electrical component of this. There's no, um, no power that's going into this one. It's a very, very simple, very elegant way of kind of getting rid of human waste. In some instances, you may have a pump. Um, so sometimes your drain field may be above your septic tank, so you, you have to pump it up. Um, so a pump is sometimes involved, and in some instances, you need a reserve area. Um, this occurs where you have heavy soils like clays. Um, you usually need a 50% uh, reserve area. And if you're in the Chesapeake Bay area, then I think it's a 100% reserve area that's usually used. Um, so a reserve area is there in case your original drain field fails. But your reserve area doesn't have to be the same design as your original drain field. So quite often you'll have a, a normal um, kind of a drain field for your original septic system. And then you'll have some kind of clever engineered uh, drain field for your reserve area. And you just hope that you never have to use that reserve area because you, 
your fancy drain field is going to be a lot more expensive. Uh, septic tanks themselves. Um, there's a few different types of septic tanks. They come in different sizes and they come in different uh, materials and made of different materials. So we've got concrete tanks, um, which are bottom right here, we've got concrete tanks, fiberglass tanks, bottom left, and we've got some polyethylene tanks uh, up on the top right. These ones are a little, these are kind of fancy plastic tanks, but you get the idea that we've got different uh, kind of things that we can make uh, septic tanks from. Um, if we look at the concrete tanks, they usually separate out into two different ways. We've got kind of a top seal or a mid seal. Um, there's kind of a, I think some people think that the top seals are, are better than the mid seals, but I don't think there's any evidence for that. But that's just where the, the two pieces of concrete are, are held together. Um, as you can imagine, the concrete tanks are going to be incredibly heavy. Um, you need a huge, great big truck with special septic tank lifting equipment that, that will uh, lift these tanks up, put them on the back and take them wherever they, you need them to go. Um, with the plastic tanks, on the other hand, they are a lot lighter, a lot easier to transport. Um, but obviously, concrete is, <laughs> is probably a stronger material than plastic, especially when you're putting kind of tons of soil back on top of the septic tank, you may have kind of some problems there. Um, so yeah, there's different types of, of um, septic tanks. And here is an image of uh, kind of a cross section of a septic tank. This one's a two compartment septic tank. So by that, I, uh, it means that on the left-hand side, there's one compartment and on the right-hand side, there's another compartment and uh, we'll find out why this is, is handy. So with these, we have an inlet. So the wastewater comes from the house and enters the tank at the inlet. Then on the other end, we have an outlet. The outlet will be set a couple of inches below the inlet. So whenever anything comes in from the inlet, it raises the water level and pushes out the outlet. So nice and simple. Um, but in the tank, we have the first point where we have kind of a magic happen. So in the tank, what we're hoping for is we're hoping for settling. So we're hoping that we get um, some settling of the, the heavy material, the solids. So they will drop down to the bottom of the tank. And we will also have um, a layer at the top, which is a scum layer. Um, you'll often hear it called fat soils and greases or fog. These are uh, things that are less dense than water and they'll float to the top. Uh, a lot of time people don't really think about those uh, materials being in the septic tank. Um, but if you've looked in a septic tank, you probably will, will be fairly aware that they exist in there. So the idea is we're kind of, we're getting rid of the solids at the bottom and the greases float to the top. And we're left with um, kind of our first level of treatment. We have uh, a cleaner, water in there. Um, the, the, the fat layer uh, is usually is usually not super thick, but I was just reading a paper um, the other day and someone had been doing measurements on these layers and someone had found one that was 57 inches thick, which I'm still struggling to believe. Uh, I don't know what they were doing in that house, but they were using a lot of grease to send it down to the septic system. Um, so in this instance, we've got the, the first treatment, we've got the, the greases off, the solids uh, down at the bottom, and then this is two chambers. So we've got this little gap um, before you get to the second chamber. The idea being that the, the, um, the greases and the solids are mostly trapped in this side of the septic system. Some will make it through, but hopefully you keep the most of them over here. And in the second compartment, you have a cleaner. Uh, cleaner wastewater and that is what is being sent to your drain field and we'll discuss the drain field in a second. Um, the, the inlet and the outlet usually have uh, T's on them um, that way anything that comes in is directed into the wastewater and it doesn't disturb, disturb the scum at the top and start the whole process again and um, this, uh, the kind of the two compartment 
um, method can be also achieved by putting um, septic tanks in series. So you can go from one septic tank to another and the second septic tank will have cleaner fluid in there. Um, so here's a kind of an animation. So wastewater comes into the house, fills up the septic tank. Over time, we get a settling. So we get the grease up at the top, the solids down at the bottom. And in the middle, we have relatively clean fluid. And so every time uh, wastewater comes in from the house, it pushes water out the other end that goes to the drain field. Whilst the uh, wastewater is in the septic tank, it is being treated, it's being consumed, broken down by microbes. These microbes exist in the septic tank and they are anaerobic because there's no oxygen in, in the, uh, the liquid there. So there's, oh, there's very little oxygen in there. So the original, the, the um, first treatment level is an anaerobic breakdown of any kind of solids in, in, the, um, in the wastewater. Um, so that's where our first treatment occurs. Uh, about 50% of your solids can be removed or reduced by the, the uh, microbial breakdown in a kind of a well-functioning septic tank. Next up, we've got the drain field. So from the septic tank, uh, it's sent out to the drain field. And if we look at the kind of the image bottom left middle, this is mostly what we think of kind of drain lines being. It's a it's a trench filled with gravel with a pipe down the middle of it. And um, each time the water enters the pipe, it drains into the gravel and then down to the soil. Um, this is where, once it enters the soil, that's where the final treatment occurs. That's where everything else will be broken down. Um, in, in order for that to happen, we need aerobic conditions. So remember in the septic tank, we had anaerobic conditions, lack of oxygen. In the drain field, we need aerobic conditions. So we need our soil not to be saturated. We need air within that soil. Um, so here's a, a little animation of, of the water moving. It goes from the septic tank, usually gets to a, a distribution box. From the distribution box, it will kind of move through to the drain field. And here's a, another kind of image. Now, in this instance, wastewater comes from the house into the septic tank, goes to the distribution box, and from this distribution box, it moves to the drain field, it moves through the soil, and as it moves through the soil, it gets treated by aerobic bacteria. The idea being that it is treated before it reaches the ground, groundwater or any um, her, uh, permeability limiting layer. So we need to make sure that there's no, no bad stuff in there um, before it reaches any kind of uh, waterway. Um, just to back up a little bit, we do have distribution boxes. Sometimes you may see them when you, if you've got a septic system, you're like, oh, what's this funny little box? It's a distribution box. And the idea with that is it separates the, um, the wastewater equally between the drain lines. If we have water just going into one drain line all the time, that's gonna cause that line to fail and then it'll back up and you'll move to the next line, which will then fail. If we can distribute it evenly across all the lines, then we're reducing this chance of failure in the, in the, um, in the drain lines. And quite often they've got these kind of cool little um, quick, um, quick devices where you can um, level off the drain, the um, distribution box, a uh, little hole, and they kind of twist inside the, the uh, pipe there so you can level it off. Because you imagine soil settles, and so your distribution box is also going to settle, and it's going to move around a little bit. Um, by using these things, you can make sure that your drain lines are getting equal uh, quantities of, of fluid. So why do septic systems fail and potential water quality impacts? Um, 
Septic systems fail usually because we have a clogging of the drain field. So the failure isn't usually the septic tank failing, it's the drain field failing, and then it backs up to the septic tank. Uh, if we can't get the, the wastewater to move through the soil in the drain field, that's where our failure is gonna, gonna be. And we can also get kind of disruption of septic tank through, um, set, we can also get problems with the septic tank microbes. So we can kill off the, the septic tank microbes in there. Some of the, the causes of failure is if we, have, if we don't have enough time for the material in the septic tank to actually settle out. Remember when we talked about septic tank a little bit back, we saw the solids drop out and the, the fats move to the top, okay? If we don't have enough time for that to happen, then those solids make it out into the drain field. If they make it into the drain field, then they will clog up the soil and prevent water moving through the soil. Um, some of the reasons why we might have problems with that amount of time that the drain field, um, that the uh, solids have to kind of break down um, or drop to the bottom is if we've got too much solids in the, in the septic tank already. So if we've got excess solids in the, in the septic tank, then the water in there doesn't have enough time to actually uh, settle out itself. Um, so we end up getting this kind of buildup of septic tank sludge. Um, if we have excessive water flow into the septic tank, we also can have um, problems with uh, failures. This was, I used to work in South Carolina. And when I was in South Carolina, <clears throat> the, the biggest reason for uh, failure was excessive water going into the, the uh, septic tank. So there'd be too many people living in a house, basically, for the design of the system. So you'd have this kind of excess uh, water entering the tank. Wouldn't allow it time to uh, break down. If you use harsh chemicals, those can kill off the microbes in the tank, which means that you're not breaking down the solids uh, quickly. Or um, sometimes if you're using excessive oils and greases, obviously you, you take, you know, certain volume of that tank. Some signs that you may see uh, for septic system failures, uh, bad odors, <laughs> you're wandering around your yard and you know you're around your drain field and you're smelling bad odors, then there's, there's a chance there's a problem going on with your septic system. Um, if you've got kind of soggy soil or wet spots, if we look over at the top right, this image here, you see that lush green grass there. There's, a, there's been some kind of septic system failure with that um, at some point. And if you have standing water on top of your drain field, you know, there's probably a problem there. If you've got slow draining fixtures um, or if you've got plumbing backups, those are both also signs of um, septic system failure. Also, if you're having water tested and you're getting kind of high levels of coliform bacteria or nitrate in nearby wells, that may indicate that you are having some kind of uh, septic system failure there. Here's some images of septic system failures. Uh, someone recently gave me, um, there was a soil scientist in Virginia and he gave me like a, a box full of results slides. So these are all from like the, the 60s and 70s. He yeah, has super cool slides. So I've spent a bit of time converting them over to, to pictures. And now I'm just obsessed with putting them in all my presentations. So these are these are quite old images from uh, from, from old work, but they, they look really good. So this one you can clearly see the drain field lines. Um, you can see that it's got that more lush grass, the, the darker green grass sat on top of the the um the drain field lines. And so we, there's obviously some problem going on there. If you look at the top right, it's the same again. You see the front yard has a drain, uh, a septic system. You can see the dark grass running along the, uh, the parallel lines of the drain field. Uh, in this instance, you can see that there's something nasty moving down that hill. <laughs> That's probably uh, some kind of a septic system failure. And this image, no, there, there, there wasn't really any instructions on, on what the images were, but 
this one just doesn't look good. It's, a, it's some kind of septic tank failure, I think, that's entering a, a waterway nearby. But these are all the kind of things that you might expect to see with a septic system failure. Um, so potential risks if your septic system does fail. Um, so if your your surface or groundwater can be uh, contaminated, which clearly not a good thing, uh, and those contaminants can be uh, excess nitrogen. So if you've got excess nitrogen, it can be washed down to waterways and cause algal blooms and eutrophication and kind of all that bad stuff that happens there. Um, you can also have uh, phosphorus. Phosphorus isn't as mobile as, as nitrogen, so it's not as big of a problem. Um, there's also kind of your emerging contaminants. Um, people who are flushing down uh, pharmaceuticals into septic systems, you can actually get the pharmaceuticals entering waterways. I'm sure that you've all probably heard about PFAS. We don't really know a great deal about PFAS. We don't know. I mean, it's basically in everything. So it's likely to be in your septic effluents and uh, yeah, so that's your emerging contaminations. Um, you can also have your heavy metals maybe in there that are moving down, microorganisms. So there's a lot of things that can be fairly nasty that uh, you may have problems with, with failing septic systems. So how can we offset this? What are some septic system maintenance things that we can do? Um, so septic system failure causes odors, factory pipes, ponding in yards, um, we're not getting full treatment of the pathogens, so they're hanging around. Um, it's not removing all the nutrients. Um, and here we see an image of, um, this is kind of the lush grass, but so we've got a failure and it's running to the end of the yard and the septic effluent is kind of running along the road, causing problems there. Mm -hmm. Similar kind of thing here, we've got the, the effluent running through the yard. And here we have some standing effluent from a failed system here. So one of the most important things is to have your tank pumps regularly. Um, so this chart here on the right, this is from a study done in Maryland. And they kind of they laid this out, how often you need to have a septic tank pumped based on the number of occupants in the house and the size of your tank. Um, and most pumping services may have an image of something very, very similar. Most of them are based on this, um, this study that they did. Um, so it kind of gives you an idea of how often you should be having your tank pumped and, you know, kind of thousand gallon tank every two and a half years with four occupants, et cetera, et cetera. Funnily, my in-laws uh, have a septic tank and I was talking to them after I got this position, they suddenly became very aware of septic tanks. And it turns out that they hadn't had it pumped for 25 years. So <laughs> that, was, that was an interesting conversation to have with them. Um, but yeah, they, they now have it pumped regularly. <laughs> so hopefully, hopefully you can all have your tanks pumped more regularly than every 25 years. <laughs> um, it does kind of vary depending on how many people are in the house. And so, so if you only got one occupant, then it's going to take a long time for your tank to fill, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so this is the old image. We had clean water going in it last time. This time we've got bad water because we've not had our tank pumped. And all of a sudden we have this bad effluent in our drain field and the drain field just stops working. Um, so you need to make sure your, uh, your pumper is licensed and has a permit to handle and dispose of the waste. <laughs> um, uh, you can find these, the, the pumpers in, um, found them, find them online or in telephone directories. I don't know if telephone directories exist anymore, but Usually you can find them online and your local health department may have a list of them as well. Um, usually the, the septic tampon will come in, they'll note the level of liquid. Um, 
that can indicate if you've got leaks in into the tank. So if you've got cracks in the tank and water's coming from the soil into the tank, it's going to be high. Or uh, if you've got cracks in, cracks in the bottom of the tank and the water's seeping out from the tank, then the liquid level may be low. These are the things that the septic tank pumper may kind of notice as he's done it. Um, he'll look for backflow from the drain field into the tank, usually pump the tank completely and check for any signs of damage. So check for signs of damage with the um, T's and just kind of give it a real good look over. Um, another way of, of extending the life of your septic system is to try and reduce household water use. And I say this as the father of a five-year-old child who spends uh, about 10 minutes washing his hands with the tap room the whole time. Try and reduce that thing happening. If we can reduce the amount of water that enters the tank, it's going to extend uh, the life of the tank because we're not filling it up as rapidly. And so uh, the, the uh, solids will be able to settle in there. Um, so by reducing the amount of water that enters the, the tank, we reduce the amount of, or we increase the amount of time that settling can occur. And here's a, a list of kind of various actions that you can take that will uh, increase the, or, sorry, decrease the amount of water entering the tank and increase the, the life expectancy of your tank. So a lot of new uh, toilets will be kind of low flow and they'll be they'll reduce the, the flow by half quarter uh, kind of big reductions take shorter showers which is easy in the summer not quite so easy in the winter when it's nice to have a hot shower um, don't leave the uh, faucet running when you're brushing your teeth all of these things can can help um, reduce the amount of liquid that's going into your into your septic tank. Uh, be careful what goes down your drain. The bacteria in your tank are very important breaking down those solids. Remember, I said earlier around about 50% of the solids can be broken down by the bacteria. Now, if we start killing those bacteria, it means that we're not going to be breaking down the solids as much. So it's going to start building up in there. So be careful what, uh, be careful what products you're putting down uh, into the septic tank. Um, so bleach isn't great for bacteria. Obviously, you know, spread out when you're using bleach. Don't use it every day, et cetera. You've just got to be kind of sensible on these things. Some of these are fairly obvious still, but paint and paint things down your, down your drains, if you've got a septic tank especially. Um, antibacterial cleaners. All of these things can kill the bacteria in, in the tank, and they can also make their way out into the soil and uh, kind of cause problems in the waterways as well. Uh, avoid flushing certain products down the toilet. Um, diapers, people flushing diapers down the, down the toilets, uh, feminine hygiene products. Flushable wipes are kind of a big one because they say flushable and they often say plumber approved or something like that, but they don't, they don't really break down particularly well. Um, there was kind of a new story, maybe maybe a year ago, two years ago, and there was a huge, great big um, clog in the London sewage system, and it was uh, it had a load of kind of flushable wipes all held together with grease and fat. It was pretty, you know, fairly disgusting thing happening there. But flushable wipes, try and avoid them. <laughs> Any plastic products, uh, excess paper, Lego. Whatever your kids start flushing down the toilet. Um, so yeah, just try and avoid putting things like that down there. And they kind of result in blockages in piping and they don't break down, so they're increasing your solids in the in the tank there. Uh, kitchen waste can also cause clogging. So if you have a garbage disposal unit, um, a lot of septic systems aren't set up with garbage garbage disposal units because it adds those solids to the tank and they take time to break down so they so they, they are, they're building up the solid part of the, the uh, septic tank. Protect your drain field, don't drive heavy things across your drain field. The drain field uh, 
should be left alone as much as possible. Uh, this image is a truck that's driven into a distribution box, I think it is there. Um, so don't park vehicles on there. Don't think that you can uh, concrete over your drain fields and create a new parking area or gravel over it and put parking on there. You've got to try and leave it as, as, uh, as much as you can. It causes compaction, which re reduces the ability of water to move through the soil and also reduces the ability of air to move out of the soil to allow water to move through the soil. Uh, try not to drive across. I mean, you've got pipes that lead to the septic tank, uh, pipes that lead from the septic tank. Try not to avoid heavy vehicles moving across those type of things. Planting near drain fields. Do not plant near drain fields. This, that's what this one should just say. Don't plant trees near drain fields. Anything that likes water will go straight for that drain field because there will be water in there most of the time. They will grow fantastically. You'll have really nice kind of trees because there's, I mean, there's um, fertilizers in there, there's liquid. So things will grow nicely. Um, but you may get instances like what we are seeing here on the right there where the roots all enter the drain pipes, uh, so the piping, and they end up cracking it. They just end up filling it. Um, over the top of a drain field, you just need to have a, a nice grass cover. Grass is, is the way forward over a drain field. Um, don't, don't plant a garden over a drain field. Uh, yeah, I don't think you want to eat potatoes that are being grown on top of a drain field. So just avoid that type of thing. Uh, try and keep drain fields as dry as possible. Drain fields will often be set up uh, a bit like the bottom diagram, kind of like a, a turtle's back. Did they mention anything about credit? Oh, Sorry? Continue. Um, they often set up like uh, turtle's backs, so the water will flow off the drain field. You want to keep water off drain fields um, because the soil is what that soil underneath the drain field is doing is, is occupying, removing the effluent water. So we want to keep any kind of uh, rainfall water away from it uh, as best we can. Uh, regulations and siting drain fields. We're going to run through this fairly quickly because it's it's not, it's, it's kind of a bit trickier stuff and we don't really need to dwell on it very much, but it gives you an idea of of why uh, drain fields are put in certain areas and why people can't have houses in certain areas and they have to kind of base it on the drain field itself. So this comes from the Virginia regulations and this is for the, the septic tank and conveyance lines. There's one that goes for the drain field as well and it is largely the same. So these are horizontal distances. You have to remain away from uh, certain uh, things on your property. So, for example, property lines. From the edge of your property line, you must be five foot away, okay? And water wells, 50 foot. You've got to stay 50 foot away from the water well with your septic tank. With your drain field, um, some, some wells are 100 foot away, so you need to keep well away from the, the, um, the wells. And it makes sense because we don't want our septic effluent entering our well water and then those drinking it. So there's all these kind of ways that we, we must be horizontally a certain distance away from uh, certain things in our, in our, on our property. We also have vertical separation. So these are how far above um, we have to be um, restrict, uh, above restrictions we have to be with our drain line. So in Virginia, we need 18 inches of soil that isn't saturated or doesn't have the water table. Before we hit uh, a water table, uh, bedrock, shrinks well soil, some kind of uh, restriction that happens there. So we need 18 inches off those and we need certain distances away from things we find on our property. Here's an image of our of, uh, vertical separation. So this is a, a trench full of gravel and here's our pipe, um, our forage pipe. That sits about four inches, I mean, six inches uh, off the bottom, six inches above the soil in the gravel. 
and then we have 18 inches of soil and that's the 18 inches of soil is where we get all of our treatment occurring. Um, soils in the regulations, some of you may have seen a textual triangle, which is going to kind of briefly talk about it, not go into it in any detail, but it kind of it, it gives an idea of certain things. So over in the bottom left, we've got our sands. Sand uh, allows water to move through very rapidly. Uh, up at the top here, we've got clay. Clay allows water to move through very slowly. And over on the right hand side, we've got silts, so kind of falling in the middle. Now, if you have a sandy soil, it means that water moves through rapidly. You can have a smaller drain field. If you have a very clay soil, you need a lot more area to get rid of the same amount of, so same amount of effluent. So you've got to have very large drain fields. So you in your yard may have a sandy clay. So you've got a clay, which means you need a, a a very large drain field. Your neighbor may have a sandy clay alone. He's got a, a texture group two, which means that water moves through rapidly. So they can have a much smaller drain field. So you can get these instances where people are right next door to each other with very, very different kind of um, sized drain fields. And this is, this is the reason why that might be occurring. And here's kind of a, a kind of a run through of, of kind of the separation. So imagine you buy this plot of land and you want to build your house here. And you think, OK, well, where am I going to put my, my septic system? And your neighbor's got a pond, so you've got to be away from the pond by a certain distance. Your other neighbor's got a well. You've got to be away from your neighbor's well by a certain distance. You've got a creek running through the trees, so you've got to be away from there. And then you call up the soil scientist, and he comes in, and he says, all of this land here has got very, very shallow soil, so we can't use that. Then all of a sudden, the only place that you can put your drain field is in the front of your property where you wanted your house so you could look out across the beautiful vista in front of you. And now your house is having to shift to the back of the property and your drain field is in the front of your property. So where, you, where your drain field can kind of determine where your property can go on, on, a, on your land, unless you've got a lot of money and then you can pay for a very uh, expensive uh, alternative system and kind of get closer. Alternative systems, that's uh, what's up next. So we talked about our conventional system earlier on, which is a very, very kind of basic system. Now we're going to talk about some of the alternatives. Some people may have seen chain systems. Usually um, the systems that we're talking about had gravel trenches with uh, drain lines running through them. You can also get these chamber systems that are essentially plastic chambers and the effluent goes straight into the plastic uh, chambers. The plastic chamber is open on the bottom, so the water, the effluent enters the soil through the, the chamber that way. Um, the nice thing about these is they are substantially lighter than gravel. So if you live kind of up in the mountains or something and you've got to try and transport a truck full of gravel, it becomes very difficult. Transporting a bunch of these little plastic things, they all stack on top of each other, it becomes very, very easy. Um, also, gravel can be expensive to transport, especially if you live a long way from your gravel source. These are lighter, kind of easier to transport. Um, they potentially have a greater storage volume in them, so more effluent can actually sit inside them, should it need to. Uh, next up, we've got a sand mound system, um, commonly called a Wisconsin mound. Um, you may see them occasionally. The idea with these is your soil on the bottom is either not appropriate, um, maybe it's too thin, maybe it's too heavy, maybe it's some kind of problem with it. So you build a, a mound of sand above it. And you can kind of see the sand here. And then on top of the sand, you put a gravel layer. And then you have a pump attached to your septic tank. That pump pulls up the, um, uh, pulls in the effluent and it doses it through the, the mound. So it gets treated before it even reaches your soil. And then what soil you do have in there, it can, uh, it can treat it that way. Um, Here's kind of an image of one going in. You can see the sand being built up. You see the gravel and then the, the piping on there. And here's one that's actually in the ground. 
I was talking to um, one of the Department of Health people and he said that he went to inspect a Wisconsin mound. And when he got there, the, the kids in the family were on little dirt bikes doing jumps, using the Wisconsin mound as a kind of a, a dirt jump thing, which <laughs> isn't great because you need that, that uh, the grass sat on top of it in order to hold the whole thing together. So yeah, don't do dirt jumping over Wisconsin mounds. Um, tends to be a bit more expensive and you need to have good uh, vegetation, reduce erosion on that. Uh, drip systems. Drip systems um, basically is another pump system and there'll be um, drip lines that run across. Next, next image we'll see some of the, the drip lines that run across. But um, every once in a while, it'll be dust, so the, the drip lines will be pressurized, and they've got little holes in them, like drip irrigation, very similar to drip irrigation, and um, the effluent leaves via that method. Um, and then there's a return, they'll take it back to the pump and it can send it back out again. These are dust, so you can send it out at any time. Um, it could be time, so you're getting rid of the effluent on a kind of a, uh, a regular basis. Uh, and here's some images of the drip system. Here we've got the purple line kind of running in and out. You can see it's it's shallower. When using drip systems, you can go in a little shallower, so that's that's good. This is over at a facility um, at Fort Pickett, which is now Fort Barfoot, um, and they've got some above ground uh, examples of the of the drain lines. Um, so this is an example of of a drip system. This is low pressure distribution, which is quite similar. Um, it's another dust distribution, and it kind of pushes the water out and allows it to drip through the, uh, the gravel layer here. Runs along very similar lines. Uh, aerobic treatment units, so ATUs. These are kind of like the, the fancy pants um, versions of uh, septic systems. These are kind of like, um, tiny little wastewater treatment plants. And they go, they will be attached to the septic tank. Um, or, well, there's various different designs, but they'll take fluid from the septic tank and they have uh, a bubbler. So they're introducing oxygen to the effluent, which is, remember how the septic tank, it was anaerobic bacteria. These ones uh, have aerobic bacteria. So a bacteria in the presence of oxygen. So we're actually getting far more breakdown of the um, of the effluent. So we've got anaerobic in the septic tank, and then it goes to the ATU. We get aerobic. Now we're putting out some much cleaner um, septic effluent, which means we could go shallower because um, so it doesn't need as much treatment in the soil itself. Uh, but these can get quite fancy, um, quite expensive. They require kind of people to come in and check up on them. There's, there's usually a contract that's that's kind of uh, done. And here's another version of one, but they've got a lot more bits and pieces, more failure points basically on them. But they are they're super cool. Um, but you do have to be a little more careful of what's going down your drain. And obviously they're going to be more expensive. Uh, sand filters. These are similar to the Wisconsin mound, but these are self-contained filters and um, water leaves the uh, effluent leaves the septic tank and it passes through a, a sand bed basically. Then it's collected and it can be then distributed to the drain lines later on. The idea being it that you have treated the effluent as it moves through the sand filter. These don't necessarily have to be made of sand um, they can also have peat in them. Uh, if we go to the next slide, this is a sand filter here, and these are peat filters. Peat operates in a, in a similar way, it kind of removes any of the kind of effluent that are sat on there. Um, there's also wet, constructed wetland systems. These are quite fancy. I don't, I've not actually seen one in action, but they're essentially a, a wetland that's created, and the septic effluent enters the wetland and it's, um, it's in a sealed container, so it can't go anywhere. And the plants are wetland plants, and they kind of remove a lot of the, the bad stuff that's in there. 
and uh, the wastewater that is now clean can move to uh, your drain line and, and kind of move back through the soil there. Um, and they use kind of aquatic vegetation like cattail, bulrushes, uh, reed grasses, etc. And I think I may have rushed through the last few ones there, but it gives us a bit of time for questions. So uh, thank you for your time. And um, if anyone has any questions, uh, let me know. Um, here's my information. If you ever need to get in contact with me, um, <laughs> office number, uh, email, et cetera. There are some questions in the chat box. Ah. Uh, let me go to the top. Um, what are design distribution challenges and issues for slopes? And could excessive wetness at the bottom of a slope be a sign of failure? Um, you, yes and no. Uh, on a slope, water is always going to collect at the bottom of the slope. So because you've got wetness at the bottom of the slope doesn't necessarily mean that your septic system is failing. It could just mean that that's where your water is collecting. Uh, septic systems, uh, drain fields are designed on slopes. They're designed to be um, deeper. And it all depends on the, the actual slope itself, the percent slope. If it's over 50%, they won't put a drain field on it. And then um, each kind of a, percentage between uh, uh, between that, they have to go certain depths in order to counteract the slope. But yes, you, you can imagine the top of the slope will add um, effluent to the second drain line of the slope and to the third line, et cetera, et cetera. But it's designed hopefully to be treated before it gets, uh, before it actually makes its way out. But yeah, it, I mean, it could be an indicator that there's a problem. It all, could also just be the fact that it's a slope where water collects at the bottom. I mean, if, if it smells bad and it doesn't look good, it, it, it may be a failure. Hope that answered it somewhat. Okay. Um, we have several other questions in the chat box, but I see that Brenda has, she had her hand up during your presentation. So I'm going to let her ask her questions and then I'll um, continue in from the chat box. Okay. Hello, Brenda. Thank you. Um, we're moving into a county that, well, we are going to have a septic system and, and well, does it matter that we have no idea what type of septic system it is? It's just as long as we have it pumped and follow your recommendations? Um, it does matter if it's, an, if it's an alternative system that requires maintenance, then it kind of matters that you know where it is. Okay. If it's a standard septic system, it should be okay. And there should be, there should be information on what type of system it is. Maybe we yeah, the, the, the owner just showed us where it is and um, he didn't, he hasn't indicated that there's any maintenance to it other than he says he has it pumped about every two years, but we don't know the size of it or anything like that. Um, there may be information on, on the exact design with the health district, but if it, it there's no electricity going to it, which means it's probably just a conventional system. And okay, doesn't Thank it sound you. like there's a problem with it. So, okay. Thank you. Okay. The next question is how does the septic system operate immediately after a tank has been pumped? It obviously takes some time for enough fluid to build up to the outlet level. Yeah. Um, it gradually builds up again. Uh, the design to, we kind of expect about 75 gallons per person a day. So the septic tanks fill up relatively quickly. It's a thousand, imagine it being a thousand gallon tank. You know, if there's a few people in the house, it's going to build up relatively quickly. Um, but it will take a little bit of time for the bacteria um, to start building up in there. Um, but it's, you know, it's, it's not going to be a problem. So, 
I, sometimes you'll read about um, some of the pumpers will pump a little bit of effluent back into the to the septic tank as almost like a starter. Um, if you make uh, sourdough bread, it's like a, a sourdough bread starter, but that's not necessarily uh, doesn't necessarily have to be done. It will it'll function perfectly fine. It'll take a little bit of time to to fill up. Um, the next one is my, my uncle told me to flush yeast down the toilet a few times a year to increase the anaerobic microbes in the tank. Is that an old uncle story? <laughs> <laughs> yes, that is an old uncle story. There's lots of tips like that. that you're meant to flush various things down, down the septic tank. But the bacteria in the septic tank are the bacteria that break down um, what's in the septic tank. You start flushing other things down. They may not feed on what's in the septic tank. They may compete with what's in the septic tank itself. So um, just leave it to what's in there. That's that's the best stuff that's, that's meant to be in there. OK, there are um, extension publications that say it's OK to plant perennials and even meadows on drain fields, just not trees and shrubs. Um, is that um, OK, and why? plant a lawn that would require watering and fertilization? Um, that, yeah, I've read the extension publication and um, I'm currently in the process of kind of consulting to, to change that extension publication. Um, we don't want anything on the septic system that can get into the pipes of force its way into kind of finding the, the fluid down at the bottom there, because that's when it can cause problems. Grass is, is good for that type of thing. It doesn't have to be, um, it doesn't have to be a pristine lawn, you just need a, a grass cover over the septic system. Um, yeah. Yeah, there's a few publications that kind of recommend various things to stick over your septic system. Personally, I wouldn't. I just stick to grass. Dr. Brown, if I could add on to that, um, you know, our typical tall fescue lawns only go down about four inches. So they're less, as Dr. Brown mentioned, they're less likely to cause a problem. But the other thing is that they're, they're sucking up some of the nutrient affluent. So they've got some water and they've got some, some fertilizer coming from that affluent. So, there's not really any need to typically to fertilize or to fertilize heavily on uh, a drain field. Most of the time, it's it can stay in pretty good condition all by itself. Thank you. Yeah, excellent. Yeah, if you remember back to those images of the failing system with the really dark grass, I mean, there's, the grass still has access to some of that, uh, those nutrients in there. Okay, um, another question is on your slide, um, one of your slides says sludge should be pumped every eight to 12 months. Do you mean that the tank should be pumped every year? Uh, uh, it's about the aerobic treatment system, I'm sorry. Oh, the ATU. That will depend on the design of the, uh, of the ATU itself. Uh, yeah, the... We want as little of the um, the sludge from the septic tank to make it into the into the um, ATU. So having the septic tank pumped more often reduces the chance of that um, the effluent making it into the ATU. And if you if there is an ATU, then usually there's some kind of maintenance plan that goes along with it that should be being followed. Um, the next question is, what type of sensors are available for septic tanks? Um, I'm not sure. What, what do you mean by sensors? Uh, septic tanks may have um, kind of uh, depth sensors, um, kind of on-off floats that let you know if it's too high or too low. And they'll send an alarm and people who've not had the septic tank for a while or just getting it won't quite know why there's a lamb going off in the yard, but yeah, there, there are certain sensors like that you can have. I'm not sure what other sensors you may want. Um, 
this question was from John C. Um, if you want to unmute and um, you can ask uh, Dr. Brown. Is he still on? Maybe he's not on anymore. Okay, um, the next question we have is, uh, my septic company recommended an effluent filter. Do you recommend these? If so, do you recommend a certain type? Do I recommend septic systems? Um, let's see. The question is, the company, the septic company recommended an effluent filter and they want to know if you recommend these, and if so, do you have a certain type? Um, I don't have a certain type. Septic, uh, the filters are the handy because they can be cleaned relatively easily. They can be, they're, they're there to stop um, sludge making its way into your drain field. So anything that helps with that is gonna help, is gonna be beneficial. So yeah, I, I, I think they're a good idea, and they can be pulled out every once in a while, and, spray it off. Um, obviously, in a very sanitary way, you need to spray them off. Don't go spraying them off in the middle of the yard or something. But yeah, I think they're, they are a good thing. OK, the next um, question is, this person hired a septic contractor for inspection system, and the inspection failed because drain field was too wet when they used the metal bar but three days ago, three days it was raining. Does that affect, that affects the inspection? Um, so the, the system's already in place or they're having the system install, installed. If it's been installed, then, then they would have to come in and work out the depth of the water standing at. So they'll look for uh, for redox features or something like that. Um, I'm not sure why it would be inspected afterwards or fail afterwards. If if you had three days of rainfall, there probably will be water standing in certain places. Um, yeah, I'm I'm not sure. I'm not sure what the metal bar is. Hello, Mr. Brown. How are you? Oh. This is Ronnie. Hey, how you doing? Thank you. Thank doing you. All right. How are you doing? Yeah. Ronnie? Good, good, Mr. Brown. Yeah, the happen is this house was under contract. And so we hired a, a septic contractor to tell us about if the system was good, you know? So they make a schedule and they arrive and they use a metal bar they introduce into the soil. And when after they come, they say, no, this, this drain field is not good because you can see it's wet. But three days ago was was raining, you know, because I saw the rest of the land was wet. I don't know if that's a fact, but his report said the drain field failed. So that means that septic system doesn't work. So, uh, well, basically, we don't know. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure about that either. I've done, I've never heard of using a metal bar to test mm. if the drain field's failed or not. Uh, sorry, Ronnie, I'm, I'm not sure it can help, but yeah, feel free to email me and I, I can um, look into it. Yeah, I'm pretty sure I have the report and maybe, yeah, because, well, we skipped that house because we don't know that was in Knoxville, in Knoxville, Virginia. So, well, because we don't know, they said, okay, fails, that means you can use this house. But, uh, well, we was wondering, I don't know why, what it means about that, that the metal bar it was wet, mm -hmm. we don't know, you know? Yeah, okay. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Oh, no problem. Okay, the next question is, um, during periods of drought, the location of one distribution line on our property becomes quite obvious. Since we see the location of only one line, does this suggest the other lines have failed? The system was built in 1965, and we do, don't have any other information about the drown, drain field location. Um, no, it, it may indicate that you're getting more effluent in one line than the others, but 
it, yeah, I don't think it means that you you get any failure. Um, yeah, I think you may just have. Maybe uh, if you if you went to the distribution box, you may be able to use the uh, the quick um, quick dials to to kind of reset that or get someone to do that. Um, but it sounds like maybe one of the lines is getting more more water in it than the other lines, but it doesn't necessarily mean you want to fill. Okay, uh, Jason Purdy said that he may be able to clarify on Ronnie's question. Uh, excellent. Hey, uh, can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, so it, it sounds like, um, or for everybody that doesn't know, I'm, I'm a senior specialist in Loudoun County. I work for the health department and I, I focus on our wineries, breweries, and subdivisions. So the metal, the metal bar is gonna be a drain field probe. Um, and Ronnie mentioned the Noakesville area. Um, that's upper Culpeper basins, heavy clay soils, and, and that area, especially if the systems have age, it, it sounds like it was showing hydraulic overloading. It, even even if it rained a few days prior to the probing of the field, you know the, the drain field is supposed to work 365 days a year. So it, it sounds like the biomat had formed in the ditches, and the contractor was probing and had standing water probably above the gravels. Uh, that they, they wouldn't have opened it up to look for redox features, um, but I think probing the ditches, if there's if there's ponded water above, it's not so much an impact of of the rain a few days prior. It's it's the fact that we just have standing pool water. Okay, thanks for it, Jason. Yeah, that makes a lot more sense. I was picturing a metal bar. I think my my mind got captured, got caught up in the the idea of a metal bar. <laughs> yeah, look look forward to the training in May. <laughs> Um, okay. And Celeste, um, and I'm sorry, I don't know how to pronounce her last name, Celeste. She's an on-site specialist for Prince William County, and she said she'd be happy to help Ronnie with his questions or access department records for the system. So um, maybe we can do a, um, now I can provide an email if that's okay um, to Ronnie. Uh, super. I think I have it on your on the registration list. Yeah, right, Ronnie, all the help you need. <laughs> um, we have Beth uh, has her hand up. Uh, she's had her hand up for a little while, so I'm going to let her unmute and she can ask her question. Uh, Dr. Brown, thank you for the presentation. It was very good. Uh, I'm an extension agent in Loudoun County, and I have a question about the inlet pipe how deep that is regularly laid down and you know i i just heard um somebody else from loudon county as well maybe he will be able to tell me more um which is a jason but uh, if you can tell me you know how deep it is because i have a farmer that wants to plant blueberries and he was thinking of using a little bit of the area where the inlet pipe goes through and and I said, you know, I think you need to contact the county to be sure that you are not close to that pipe. So uh, blueberries don't have a very deep root system, and we usually plant them on a, on a raised bed. So what do you think about this? Yeah, I think he needs to find out how deep it is himself. I wouldn't, I wouldn't be comfortable saying it is an exact depth. Um, I would, I would try and find out physically how deep it is. But so if, let's say, it's deep enough, and I don't know what is enough, um, do you think that on that type of uh, inlet pipe, it will be okay to plant something? Ooh, that's an interesting question. <laughs> um, hmm. And maybe Jason, I don't know if you can help me with this. Yeah. <laughs> I, 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 I just put my contact information in the chat, Beth. Um, have Thank your, you, your farmer reach out. I'll go through his septic system records with him and uh, we can that way we can make a more informed decision. I appreciate. Thank you. Absolutely. Take care, Dr. Brown. Thank you, Jason. Dr. Brown, we have 
follow up question. John, who didn't unmute, um, he's having some problems with his sound. He was the one who asked about sensors. Um, uh, and he was wondering if there were sensors that could tell when the tank needed to be pumped. Is there too much sludge? Is there enough bacteria? Um, are there clogged drain fields, et cetera? Uh, no, I don't think there are any sensors that's going to tell you exactly that. Um, you tank because it's going to it's going to leave at the uh, the outlet pipe. It's always going to be about the same level. I'm not sure there's anything that you can actually use to um, that measures the depth of the sludge in there. You can get uh, kind of sludge judge uh, cool things that you can dip in the septic tank. But, and then pull them back out, and we'll give you depths of of um, of your sludge and your your grease. But there's nothing that that will continuously be monitoring your septic tank. Are there any other questions? Well, thank you everyone for coming, and a big thanks to Dr. Brown. And you have his contact information um, if you need more direct uh, assistance down the line. And thank you all for coming, and we'll see you next time. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Great program. That's the most questions about septic tanks I think I've ever had. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. Thank you.